Hey, welcome in everybody to the latest edition of the Royal Take as I'm joined again by great super fan Hector who is now going to be joined with the season ticket sector next season as well instead of just buying different bargain tickets each game. And we're going to get into the playoff preview. I did one with Ryan, so check that out where we kind of talked about a, a bunch of different stuff for 30 minutes. This one will be about 20 to 30 as well. We will be previewing the series, giving our series prediction and getting Hector's viewpoints to see if they line up with what Ryan and I were talking about in the next thing, or if he has some other ideas as well. And um, if there's some things he sees a little bit differently. So it's di it's always good to get different points of view. But also please continue to subscribe down below or up above on these huge widgets to keep the channel growing. We really appreciate your guys' love and support this far. But Hector, first and foremost, how are you doing today? I I'm doing good, man. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Yeah, I really appreciate you hopping on. Um, I think, obviously, we know it, especially Maine being a second-best power play to Toledo, I believe, if I remember correctly from looking at the league stats at the end of the season. Uh, you, The biggest key to this series is continuing to be the most disciplined team in the ECHL and continuing. To, they broke a freaking record, first of all, for at least penalty minutes in a season, so that's a plus. Um, and if you continue to be that good of a disciplined team, you're going to beat Maine, in my opinion, because their greatness is on special teams. Their greatness is not on 5-on-5. Five five. Are they good 5-on-5? Five five? Sure, but they're average to good 5-on-5. Five five. Maine's great if you put them on the special teams, and that's really their bread and butter, their special teams of their PK and of their um, power play, because their PK is like 82% too, which the Royals have a good PK that's like 80, but the Maine's was like 82% or something like that. So wouldn't you say the key um, would be to still play within your element, even though we added the Saunies of the world, we added the Kevin Conley's of the world, we added the Will McKinnons, the Royals still played in their disciplined element, even with those grinders and basher players on their team that I just mentioned. Don't you think that's kind of the, one of the main keys coming into this series? The main key to coming into this series is going to be we have to keep them off the power play. We have to stay we have to go five on four. Like we cannot make mistakes because the more mistakes you get in the playoffs, it's going to cost you. Yeah, I agree. The only benefit, I don't know how, but hopefully our power play defensively, Hector and I, uh, or Ryan and I talked about that, Hector, I should say, where the problem is, I don't know how beneficial it is for us to, with how good Maine is shorthanded. I don't know actually in this series how beneficial it would be for us to go on the power play because their PK is great and our power play defense has been mediocre for the second half of the season. So, like, that, like, I almost think with how good we are five on five and Trevor Gooch even said it in the pre-playoff uh, press conference you can all watch on uh, YouTube, on the Reading Royals YouTube that I did with uh, myself, uh, Melanie, uh, Matt Knob, and then um, I'm trying to remember the guy from W. Uh, WEXP, the uh, or whatever it is up there, the WFMZ, the the TV station um, that we did. He talked about how great the Royals are as a five on five team because our power play left a lot to be desired this year. Let's be honest. Where the Royals are great five on five and they're a great PK team, their power play is bit. Where at the end of the season it started getting better and that was a good sign. But one of the, if I had to pick the weakness of our team, it would be the power play. So I like agree with you on that one, I'm sorry. That, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, go ahead. You could, What were you going to say? I can agree with you on that one. The power play does need a lot of work, I'll give it that, because I was at Saturday night's game, and they had multiple opportunities to capitalize on the power play, and they didn't. Yeah, exactly, and they also have allowed, before, at least when the power play was doing good up until the month of February, they didn't allow a lot of shorties. Then all of a sudden, February to the end of the season, they were not good in transition defense on the power play, which is not a thing you want to see because you shouldn't be bad in transition defense when you have the favorite uh, of men on the ice. So uh, that's what kind of – well, I feel like the best way to beat Maine is actually 5-on-5 five five because they're not that great 5-on-5. Five five. They're a I could definitely solid agree on team 5-on-5 five five to good 5-on-5, five five, but their bread and butter, like I said, is the power play. Where we're great 5-on-5 five five and not fantastic on the power play where we're good on the PK. So, like, even though they have the second-best power play, we've already stopped their power play a couple times in games because of how good the Royals are on the PK. But that doesn't mean I want to put them on the power play any more than we have to. But I think the best way is 5-on-5 five five in this series just because they're an average to good at best 5-on-5 five five team. We're a great 5-on-5 five five team. 
the last few games I've been to, they've actually have not caused that many penalties. Very clean. Yeah, well, the Royals all season have been, like I said, we broke the record for uh, least penalty minutes in an entire ECHL season, according to Kirk. So That is awesome. Uh, they've been the most disciplined in, in the history of the league, where when you have guys like Losey, like the Chara, like now you added Mac, Will McKinnon, uh, Brody Clay's almost fought a goaltender in his first game, so that's nice to see. Uh, like, you have depth uh, throughout the lineup. And you have guys that might not play as round and pounding as they can just because we are so disciplined. They don't want to get those ticky tacky calls that are in today's hockey more than the past that you don't see as much in the playoffs. So I wouldn't be surprised if Lowe, who was already physical at times, the Char, who's already physical at times, McNally's already physical at times, McKinnon already has been massively physical. But if those guys step it up, because they know you get away with a lot more in the playoffs. The only thing I agree with Kirk McDonald, and we talked about it before the podcast, is with two refs, you might have a game that there's like the first game that might be more calls just by default because there's more eyes to just see what's going on. But I don't think there's going to be, I don't think it'll be called tighter, so to speak. There might just be more calls by default because there's more eyes on the game, so to speak, within the regular season, where in the playoffs, usually hockey reverts back to the early 2000s or earlier where you get away with stuff. You don't get any of those just little chippy, like, flop penalty calls or the, like, scratch and claw penalty calls. Like, it kind of goes back to you can lay out somebody and they let you get away with a little bit more slashes, a little bit more hooking, because they just know it's more physical in the postseason, where I think the Royals, with how disciplined they are, but the ability they have to be brute in moments – is going to be a key in the playoffs as well because they can play a lot more physical than they do. They just don't do it because they don't have to do it. Yeah, I can agree with that one. I can definitely agree with that. They haven't been fighting as much lately either. No, and I mean, because they don't. I mean, if you're if you're rounding at the season, you also don't want to get injured, obviously. So it's it's almost not wise to fight at the end of the regular season if you're already kind of set in stone at the division winner. Yes, you're fighting for, obviously, the clinching of the first place, which you played a meaningful game to the final game where they could have topped Toledo uh, in the standings if Toledo lost, uh, to my recollection. But uh, they still won. Hockey had a great final showing. That's something I want to get into next. Um, oh, that Aiden was amazing. Hockey being a um, really good backup for this team. He's a perfect back. He's not a starter, but what he is is a perfect backup that steps up in given moments and can go on runs for you, and that's all you need in somebody like him. Oh, yeah, I actually got to ice skate next to him at the, at the post-game skate. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah, I forgot they were doing a mix with the guys. Yeah, they do post-game skates, and then you actually get to go out there. They You can run skates, meet the players, and it's really awesome. Yeah, those are cool that they do. They do a lot of good events, the Flyers Fridays, the post-game skates, the uh, mm. Autism Awareness Night that Ryan is the one that organizes that. So the the, the, the Royals obviously do a good the giveaways for the bobbleheads. Oh, I um, love that. So, you, I get yeah. there early. You got to get there by 5 o'clock to get the giveaways. Yeah, yeah, you got to get there a little bit earlier for that. But most people get there. There's a good amount of the season ticket holders that are there by five because once they open the doors i see them walking consistently as i'm walking up and down the steps and all that stuff or walking through the stadium before the game starts but um when it comes to goaltending though obviously we know flow is our guy uh kirk's hinted at that throughout the rest of the end of the regular season he would not say to matt who the starter would be but that's for strategic purposes matt basically asked him so do you have in mind who the starter is? And he said, yes. And he said, would you share that information? Absolutely freaking not. So it's but that's more of a. Because he wants thing. to surprise him. That's yeah, the one thing. But, I think but, he's going to have a little something up his sleeve for Maine. Yeah, but we do know that Flo is going to be the main cat in net. And then even if Pat Nagel comes down, from what Kirk said in pressers at the end of the season, it sounds like Flo is still going to be the main guy. And then you would go to, you have the veteran Pat. For if, say, he struggles, you have a guy that's one of the best all time in the ECHL to fall back on when he comes back down from the Phantoms once their season ends, unless if they somehow miraculously make the playoffs, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen. So uh, what what is your um, take on Flodell? For me, uh, I have definitely all the confidence in the world. In him. Oh, oh, the, oh, he looks phenomenal. He's going to help us get past this first round and get us into the second round. I honestly think maybe – I really hope that um, he can – that um, that uh, hockey can get in there a little bit. Yeah, it'll be interesting. Sometimes you will mix a backup in. Like, like say if we go up in the Series 3-0, like, say if we're just killing Maine, 
then you might say, well, we're going to give Hayden a game because we're up for it doesn't matter if we lose this one game. But, like, not that we think he's going to lose the one game, but he's just not Logan Flodell where you're, you're, you're keeping his feet wet. Where you do see those guys mix in. Usually in the postseason, though, you try to ride, in my own view from watching, you try to ride one guy for the most part, and then you mix in the backup just so his feet are still wet if you can. So if it's a series that you're beating the team up enough that you don't think you need your starter in every game, then you're probably mixing in. Or in that three and three, I could see since we're on the road, we play Wednesday, Friday, and then when they go to Maine, it's the three and three. I could see them uh, putting in hockey in either that middle game or the end game, and Flo would play back to back at the starter. So Flo would play the first four games if we don't win the first four games, and then Hawk would play the fifth. Or you would have Flo play the first two, Hawkey play, or not Hawkey, Flo play the first of the road, Hawkey play the middle of the road, and then Flo come back in game five if you have to have a game five. Like you could do it. There's different ways you can do it. But typically, you do ride with one guy. But I see what you're saying. You definitely want to keep his feet wet. That's definitely good. Yeah, it's gonna be like it's gonna be a phenomenal series, and I honestly do believe we are going to win this series. Oh, I do too. Yeah, I, I think we're gonna win this series. I also have to point out, uh, Usti's not likely. He's listed as a guy that's eligible, but he's really probably not because he's battling an injury. But 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 a uh, Nagel definitely is gonna be back most likely. Charlie Gerard is another speedster. Uh, Ryan brought that up. A good speedster with a great shot, similar to Sonia in the AHL. He's more of a bottom sixer, but in the ECHL, Charlie Gerard is clearly a top six level talent that skates with the wind and has a good shot. So adding him back into the mix is almost like a trade acquisition, just like Kirk McDonald said, Brennan Son. Yeah, he was a trade acquisition. Mm-hmm, definitely. And then also Matthew Strom, a guy that's become a fan favorite for a short time there. Garrett McFadden, who's been huge. Darian Hansen, who had the great debut. Um, all these guys are playoff eligible. Hanson and Ned is a guy that I really like and think has a chance to be a good goalie for the organization. Probably grow with the Royals, I would think, over time, just because of the goalies the Flyers have with the Phantoms. But maybe he'll get a shot with the Phantoms out of the jump next year. But I don't necessarily see it just because if Ivan Fedotov does somehow find a way to come over from Russia, they're just going to have too much goaltending uh, to fit somebody else into the Phantoms roster. But <clears> – <throat> When it comes to the series, you already said you think the Royals are going to win. So do I. Let's just get into when it comes to our defense. We got Cecile, Cockrell, Cormier, McKinnon, McNally, and Millman. Millman's somebody that should be up for the rookie of the year. Definitely. Um, with how good he's played since coming in. Another guy, though, that um, Ryan Smartly points out, Kenny Halsinger, who I always loved as well. Um, the first time I got the pleasure of hopping on with Eric to do the color commentating. Uh, I talked about how Kenny, with that point, Josh Winquist was still on the team. So with certain guys out of the lineup with injury, how he's a guy that will probably step up because he's always in the right spots, always doing the right things. He just doesn't always get the finishing product from another guy finishing with one of his great passes, or maybe he misses the net. But the, when guys went down, he exponentially stepped up this year, went a little bit cold. Uh, to round out the season until the final five games. And then he started playing really good again. So he got hot again at the right time. So I think he, as a rookie uh, on the forward court, plays above his his years. And then Mason Millman plays well above his years because the dude's 20 years old and plays like he's about 27. So, like, there, like there's no panic. I don't know if you agree with that, but, like, when you watch Millie play – there's no panic in his game when you see 27-year-olds in the league have panic making the same plays as that 20-year-old's making. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. The defense has been spot on. Like, they, they haven't allowed that many goals like I've seen in their games. Like, the defense has been doing phenomenal. The whole team all together has been doing the phenomenal. Like, it's great. Yeah, it's been a whole co conglomerated effort between forwards that played very tight neutral zone defense for most of the season. There's been obviously a couple games mixed in. You can point out that didn't happen, but that's in any season. Uh, and some of the 17 losses, they also broke the record for regulation losses because mm -hmm. they tied the points record, but um, the Royals broke the record for least regulation losses for this year because Which the 2013 good. team had 19 losses. But because of overtime points, they still had the same points as this year, where the this year's team had 17. 
uh, but tie that point total. So it's tied for the point total, but the best team of all time in the 20 years of Reading when it comes to regulation loss total. So there, there's that plus the fact that they're the best team of all time for Reading when it comes to discipline, just statistically. Mm. Um, so that's something that's also big to see. And also Gucher and uh, Tomas Evans talked about that in the press conference too, how they remember when him and uh, Tomas were together before the pandemic, the season that got shut down when we were five games behind, or not five games, five points behind Newfoundland. Um, they were a very disciplined team that year. And then Gooch went to play overseas and all that, yada, yada. Tomas went to play for a different team. And then he came back once the Royals were back because he wanted to play here. He thought they had unfinished business. And he kept on Trevor Gooch the entire time he was overseas to say, hey, we still have unfinished business here, blah, 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 blah. And then that, that he's a Tomas Ebbing is a big part of why Trevor Gooch came back around December and became one of the carrying weights, and you got to hear the gooch throughout the entire stadium again. Oh, I love Tomas that. Ebbing, Tomas Ebbing was the biggest reason, uh, as well as Kirk McDonald, obviously, that that it seemed like uh, Gucher came back because he seemed to be on him. That's what Gooch was saying uh, the entire season. Like, we still have unfinished business from two years ago. Let's run it back. So, that sounds good. And then on top of that, we didn't have the Jackson Cressies on that team. We didn't have the Kenny. Like, this team is honestly better than that team, in my opinion, because on that team you had great discipline and everything, but you didn't have the Jackson Cressies. You didn't have the Snipers and Bykoff. You didn't have the uh, Kenny Hosinger, who's a small kid just like uh, Sonia, but doesn't give a crap about his size and will fight anybody and go to anywhere on the ice, even though he's 5'8 or 5'9 or whatever, just like Brennan. So it's good to have – those two types of players on your team, especially for the postseason, those chippy guys that don't care about the fact that they're small as heck and will play like they're six foot seven. So um, I think those two really are going to benefit the Royals in the postseason. And Jackson Cressy, to me, uh, you can say if you agree or disagree with this, I think he's had moments of roller coasterness, but at most of the year, He's been a very good for a rookie two-way player and a very good face-off guy and a very good speed skater that over time it seems like all of that's going to make him maybe one of the better players in the league because he's right now is in a third-line role trying to figure it all out still and put everything into the perfect blend instead of the very good blend he has going right now. Once he kind of finds that perfection, it seems like he could be a top-two-line center. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. And then what would be your projections for Halsinger from Washington this year? Do you think he's a top six guy in the making in the future too? I do believe that. Yeah. He's just, he's been playing great. And you know, there've been like, he's one of the main reasons that they're winning. Correct. Yes, I agree. Him, uh, Cressy, those are the guys you don't always see on the score sheets. Uh, and they're, they're, they're still big cogs and massive reasons they're winning. Same goes with Cooper. Uh, I have to throw in Grant Cooper in there because Kirk said this in post. He just blocks shots, gets in the lane, sacrifices himself all in all for the team. He hasn't played every game this year, but whenever his calling card was called upon, he stepped up to the plate and played really well. He's another guy because I just love the role players that just know the role and fill it perfectly because they know they might not be Mr. Like perfection like Trevor Gooch or Tomas Ebbing that are stars of the league, but they're very good at the role that they have or Jacob Pritchard, who's a star of the league. But but those guys know in Cooper, I'm great at this. I'm great at defense. I'm great at blocking shots. I'm great at just cutting down lanes in the O zone and the uh, defensive zone, the O zone to keep the puck in the zone and the defensive zone to get the puck going the other way. Let me just do that and just worry about that, and then the rest will come. And that's exactly what happened with Grant Cooper because – he started playing his game completely and just worrying about all the small stuff he's great at. And then he started scoring more too. So that's to me why Kirk McDonald, I even said it when I did the radio recon live with Eric, the one time I got the pleasure to fill in for Pat on that too, which was a fun to do. That bar is amazing. That Jimmy G's railroad house. I definitely recommend people to go there. It's an amazing place. Um, but uh, when I did that, I said, Kirk McDonald's the best coach in the Flyers organization. And it's not even close. Because you get the, he's the guy that puts guys in the right mindset and in the right spots to succeed consistently. Ian LaPierre, I excuse because it's his first season and he's learned during the time. Mike Yo doesn't have an excuse and AV didn't have an excuse. So that's kind of the way that I feel about uh, that. But 
when it comes to this one, <coughs> Kirk's great at developing guys. He's great at picking talent out. And he's great at um, making those guys into the best version of himself. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, I definitely do agree with that. Um, but also, I don't think this is even a hot take, but would you say we have the best coach in the league? I can honestly say we do have the best coach in the league and the best dressed coach in the league. That too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, he definitely. Um, the one that I always find funny is that red one, just because it doesn't go um, with the uh, with our uniforms really at all. And then Kirk's just kind of rocking like this red uh, red uh, suit and everything like that. But I think we might be having some uh, technical issues uh, right now. It looks like Hector might have uh, froze up. But um, so I'll just wrap this up here. We have about 20 minutes anyway, which is about how long I wanted to go. We got to talk about the playoffs this far and how good the team's going to do going into the postseason. Uh, we got to talk about the defense. We didn't really fully get into the forward court, but it's been a good 20 minutes of getting Hector's thoughts on it. I apologize. We probably would have went another about five minutes, but Skype being Skype is going to Skype sometimes, and that's just the way it is. As he's frozen 